From the Rhodes Centre for International Economics and Finance at Brown University, this is the Rhodes Centre podcast. I'm Mark Blythe. On this episode, I talked with economist Pavlina Chernova about a policy proposal that's having a moment here in the US, the creation of a federal jobs guarantee. As Pavlina describes it, it's not just a good idea, but in the face of our economic, environmental and epidemiological crises, it may be a necessary one. Pavlina is Assistant Professor of Economics at Bard College and author of The Case for a Job Guarantee, a Financial Times Best Book of the Year. She is also a leading figure in the world of modern monetary theory, which, as you'll hear in our conversation, is deeply connected to her conception of how this kind of policy would work. We talked about how a jobs guarantee would function in America, why it may be better for the economy than universal basic income, another proposal that is having its moment, and why now may be the moment for this type of intervention. Here is my conversation with Pavlina. Welcome, Pavlina. It's great to chat to you. Thanks for having me, Mark. Why do you think now is the moment where people are receptive once again to the idea of the federal government, or if you don't live in the United States, the central government, actually giving people guaranteed employment? What is it about this moment that's made this topical again? Yeah, I think there are a number of reasons why the conversation is reviving. I think part of it has to do with the fallout from the 2008 financial crisis. I mean, we endured some of the highest unemployment rates uh, in the post-war history and then slogged through the longest jobless recovery that we had seen. I mean, it took 12 years to bring unemployment down to 3.5%. And, you know, if you look at it regionally, you know, there are communities across the United States that are perennially in the double digits. And I think we were rethinking economics on many multiple levels, you know, how the financial sector should work, what public policy should do. But jobs was one of those conversations that was left on the back burner, which is the reason why we went through a very prolonged jobless recovery. As now people are saying, okay, how can we move forward? You know, we, we're looking for structural solutions and the job guarantee is that sort of policy response um, that attempts to add to the safety net, if you will, a public option, uh, for, ba- for, for lack of a better word, um, a, a transitional program, just a promise that if you go and look for a job, you can find it and that we have multiple ways of, of dealing with unemployment. So um, that, I think, is part of the conversation. But of course, the danger is that, you know, attention will wane once the crisis has left us. And so it's important when we articulate what the job guarantee is to talk about it, not just as a crisis program that we just pull out of a pocket and implement now and then forget about it five years later when it's actually doing its magic. So I want to talk about two ideas, one which has also got a great deal of public currency and is often seen as the alternative proposal um, to a jobs guarantee, which is universal basic income. And then the other one is uh, active labor market policies. Because in a sense, active labor market policies and the jobs guarantee are pushing in the same direction, right? What they're trying to do is get people into work and also compress wages and raise the wage floor so that basically you have a better kind of capital labor share. Whereas UBI seems qualitatively different. It is premised upon the fact that the world of work is going away. So how do you think about those two alternatives vis-a-vis the job guarantee program? On the UBI question, I am not convinced by the argument that the world of work is going away. Now, that comes from two places, typically. One is that maybe there is some technological Armageddon that we are facing. And on this issue, I'm with the roboticists. They don't believe that we are anywhere near um, that technological, uh, those kinds of technological advancements to displace our jobs. Um, The second the thing is that, you know, we've had these conversations about technology taking away jobs for a very, very long time. And my position is that, you know, 80 percent of the jobs of the future we haven't even conceived of today. So the question is, what will that world of work look like tomorrow? And I think that's the anxiety that a lot of people are feeling. And, you know, there is a little bit of resignation that if we just can't create jobs, by God, let at least give people income which I, you know, I'm sympathetic to the view, but I'm not sympathetic to the view that we cannot create jobs. 
because there are plenty of um, things that we need to do that are not done. We acutely uh, see this and feel it in our communities, in our you know public social life that you know there's dilapidated infrastructure, there are communities in disrepair, there are environmental problems. I mean, there are care needs. There's lots of work to be done, and we just um, need to be able to do it. So the job guarantee will be one mechanism, you know, not the only one, but it will be one mechanism to deliver some of those social services that are missing. Now. On the second question of labor, active labor market policies. Now, that is a question of how we restructure the world of work going forward. Um, and, you know, we need a multi pronged uh, 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 you know, attack, clearly, uh, because we have had the hollowing out of the manufacturing sector, middle income jobs, et cetera, the loss of union work as well, and some of the protections that came with those good. Uh, jobs and the gigification, of course, of work. So um, what can we do going forward? Should we accept sort of the precarity um, or can we actually create a new world of safe and secure work? You know, the example I often give is manufacturing. Um, that was extremely dangerous um, in the last century, uh, and, you know, the 19th century. It was very um, uh, poorly paid and it was not a good job. And yet today we identify manufacturing with the good jobs and the good communities they engendered. So today, 80% of our economy is a service-based economy. What can we do to restructure service work to provide the same kind of support um, and income for working people? The job guarantee is the is basically the standard, the public um, wage floor, if you will, that then the economy will need to match. And so in that sense, it is, it is a structural reform of a very particular kind. It secures the floor. So the active labor market side of this, coming at this from a kind of more Scandinavian labor market one is, that's fine, we totally get the floor, but there's a problem with the floor and the you don't really get any kind of incentive to increase productivity if you have a floor and it's just a floor. That model is much more focused upon a training component and essentially compressing wages to force firms to go out of business if they're inefficient and redeploy labor to those more productive parts of the economy. Is there a way in which the job guarantee can basically be shaped to have that type of positive thing that comes off of more active labor market policies? No, absolutely. These are not either or. One way to think about this is that um, the job guarantee is not just securing the floor, but it is a stabilizer, economic stabilizer. And the way it can accomplish this is if it actually effectively transition, pe transitions people back into private sector employment uh, or other forms of more stable sector, you know, nonprofit public sector employment when the economy recovers. Now, um, that kind of transitional aspect to the job guarantee would work exactly if we have the appropriate training, education, apprenticeships, and um, auxiliary, if you will, uh, service, support services to help people be successful in whatever they want to do. So I think that these are these go hand in hand. What I think is a bit more problematic is if we have active labor market policies without a job guarantee, then what happens is that we are kind of shuffling people along the unemployment line, if you will. Some lose their jobs or they get them. And it is um, it, it will be a no-win situation for somebody. And when we talk about productivity, I usually um, like to put the emphasis on uh, an economy that has some unemployment, however small or large. That is zero productivity. You could argue it's even negative productivity if we account for all the social costs of unemployment. So employing the unemployed is more productive than uh, having unemployment. So with that in mind, it's obviously better to employ resources than not employ resources. Your jobs guarantee and your sort of broader work is associated with uh, a school called Modern Monetary Theory. And on the podcast, we previously spoken to Stephanie Kelton. Uh, I myself has been described basically as MMT adjacent. I like that one. That's a good one. So I want to talk about the relationship between the jobs guarantee and MMT. Do you have to have a kind of MMT economy for the for this program to work? Or can you do it without actually the type of re-engineering and rethinking the economy that MMT demands? Well, Maybe it's worth saying that MMT typically is a, a descriptive analytical project. It's a framework of analysis of thinking. And there are few proposals that come out of the MMT body of work. The job guarantee is one of them. 
So why is there that fit? Why the homology between the two? That's right. Okay. And so MMT highlights the important powers of the government in delimiting their monetary system. Okay. You know, one of the things that we say is that the currency is a public monopoly. And there are a whole host of implications that follow from that. But what that means in simplest terms is that the state, the government has exclusive spending powers um, that no other agent has. The second MMT component that um, is probably not very familiar to folks is that um, government, by virtue of the monetary system, creates a certain kind of unavoidable unemployment. And when the public sector imposes taxes, whatever they are, fines, fees, dues, you know, unavoidable, inescapable, they're all in monetary terms. We all have to pay them. Um, And if we're unable to acquire the resource to pay them, we're in trouble. But it is the government that is the ultimate source of of the financing, right, of of the currency that settles those debts and dues. So in a way, in a somewhat abstract way, that the tax system creates unemployment, monetary unemployment. When you say unemployment, is somebody seeking wage work. And if you then create unemployment, but then you abdicate your responsibility for solving the problem of unemployment, then you have you know, a dysfunctional macro model. So in that sense, the job guarantee is, is essential. And you know, I should add here, you know, why does the government impose these tax liabilities and obligations on the public sector? It's not because it needs funding, but it, because it needs resources. You know, somebody has to sell something to the public sector in exchange for a currency, and usually they provide uh, labor uh, and resources. And so the, the tax system actually reorganizes our collective public provisioning. And so the job guarantee is that missing piece. You can actually employ the unemployed in that process of organizing uh, for the community as a whole, for the, uh, for the economy as a whole. So I see how it follows from that framework, as you put it. But um, Gordon Brown, for example, when he was Labour uh, Prime Minister, actually not just Chancellor, he kind of ran a de facto job guarantee at the start of the crisis. And there have been other attempts. I mean, India is not running a sort of an MMT economy. They have the largest jobs guarantee program. Uh, so is it a necessary homology or, you know, can you do this without, in a sense, going full MMT? I'm just wondering because I can see how people are either attracted to MMT and perhaps not the job program. People like the job program because they like it better than UBI, but they're a bit concerned about, do I need to buy MMT? And just trying to tease out the necessary con- relationship between them. Yeah, I think that... It is not necessary to understand why MMT and the job guarantee are attached at the hip. It helps. Um, but if you do not, if you're not convinced by the MMT premises, I think that we can agree on the fact that the public sector is nevertheless always responsible for macroeconomic stabilization or the fallout from unemployment. So in some, in some sense, these uh, costs of unemployment are already part and parcel of the budget. Now, what MMT does say is that if you have sovereign currency or monetary system um, that is not, um, you know, you're not pegged to some other currency or you're not part of a monetary union, you have a lot more fiscal space. You are able to address public concerns in much more aggressive manner. But it's still true that if you're part of the Eurozone, you still have to deal with unemployment. You still have to bear those costs. And they will be resources that will be expended. And it is better to employ people than not um, employ them. And so I think that um, the merits of the job guarantee are there, even if you don't have monetary sovereignty. But granted, they will be you know, much more careful budgeting, resource allocation that might come into consideration and smaller policy space. So let's turn to a much more micro level. So I've lived in the United States for about 30 years. And one of the sort of the definitions of the US that I I walk around in my pocket with is this is a place where if you're unemployed, it's your fault. Uh, As opposed to in countries where I grew up, where it was very much the case that if I'm unemployed, it's the government's fault and you need to do something about it. How do we deal with that difference in political culture if you want to basically have a program that says, no, honestly, this isn't really anyone's fault. It is a macroeconomic problem and it is the government's responsibility to do something about it and it can do something about it. How do, how do you fight against those, if you will, folk wisdoms that ultimately, if you lost your job, even if there's a big crisis, it's your, jo- it's your problem because 90% of people didn't lose their jobs, even if 10% did? Yeah, 
There are those folk wisdoms that can be deployed effectively, I think, by policymakers. Um, I think the counter argument to that is that, at least in recent history, the job guarantee has been polled. I mean, we've been polling that idea that the government is responsible for providing uh, employment opportunities to the unemployed since at least the late 60s. And it consistently polls very well, up, upwards of 60%. More recently, though, and especially after the great financial crisis, um, the Gallup poll came out with a, with a number of uh, 70 to 73%. The most recent polls uh, from 2019 are again up you know, in the mid-70s, high 70 I mean, it polls really very well, and it's a bipartisan um, support. And in a way, that, that sounds you know, a little shocking in light of the folk tale. You know, why mm -hmm. would people be supporting it if they're this, in the same breath, they're also saying it's your fault? I think it's because the lived experience for most people is that their jobs are insecure, um, mm -hmm. that uh, they don't know when one a good one will be around the corner. They know somebody who's unemployed, uh, who's working, sending hundreds of resumes. And so I think that there is definitely a, not necessarily cognitive dissonance, but there, there are two tales, if you will, yeah. of America. You know the the very precarious labor market experience and and you know the need the need for for a job. So if we look at the world from the lens of what the job guarantee is trying to solve, we have labor force participation has fallen, particularly since the Great Recession, even though it's up. So when you say four percent unemployment, it depends on what you mean relative to what potential labor force participation is. We live in a world in which it seems to be very hard to generate any inflation, which strongly suggests, again, there are unemployed resources which could be usefully put to work. We face a climate disaster, which we were told three years ago we had 12 years to fix, and so far we've done the square root of nothing. So this would seem to be a policy that kind of checks a lot of boxes. So why then would it be that, for example, private sector businesses would be against this? What's in the current system that stops us moving, right? What's the political economy that stops us going this way? You know, I'm not so sure that private the captains of industry right now are out there talking against it. That's, I think, not our current problem. Although the the, the political economy concern that you know Kalecki identified long ago is not to be ignored. Now, I don't think this is an unsurmountable problem. A lot of people say, well, captains of industry will always oppose it. Um, but as you mentioned in the you know, introduction, India has an enormous uh, job guarantee program um, and it covers many households, 30% of households. And clearly, captains of industries didn't, you know, uh, didn't win. They, you know, there will be an ongoing debate and uh, I think... Uh, need to defend the need for the program, but you know laws are being passed and they can be passed. When you say the job guarantee checks in a lot of boxes, I think that is absolutely correct, and it is maybe um, that we haven't paid attention for a very long time to this need of the public sector um, to do the heavy lifting. I mean, I've, I talk to you know uh, uh, congressional aides sometimes, and you know I use the New Deal program and and. And for relatively progressive folks, and they say, oh, yeah, the CCC, I didn't think about that. Now, why didn't we think about that? Because we have just, you know, forgotten that history, that very critical, important history. And I think people are awakening a little bit that, you know, we could just use that tool yet again. Now, the climate uh, disaster is the most important thing I, I think that, you know, anyone needs to be working on. And so in that sense, the job guarantee is an ally. And what I'm hoping to do in my work is just to articulate why it makes good economic sense and that we there is no trade-off between jobs and inflation, jobs and technology, jobs and climate, and these goals can be accomplished together. So the one question, of course, that everyone is going to ask, whether or not they, you know, think about MMT budgetary categories or not, and let's face it, most people don't, is how much is this going to cost? So you did a study where you basically budgeted for 15 million people in this program at 15 bucks an hour, also including, which I thought was quite generous, full benefits on a reasonable standard. And I believe also in the study was affordable uh, daycare, which is something that the vast majority of Americans simply don't have. So that 15 bucks, when you add in benefits and you add in daycare, has got to be about $26, $27 an hour. 
if you're doing that for 15 million people, what does that add up to as a kind of portion of GDP? What would it be like? We, we're spending equivalent to what we spend on X, right? What would that be? Okay, so we are, you know, about 1% of GDP, uh, you know, 1.5% of, of GDP. Think of it as um, maybe uh, two-thirds of the military annual military budget, okay, to employ 15 million people with very generous benefits. Now, I wouldn't even think about it this way. Like, that would not even be the way that I would approach the question. One thing that um, I want to uh, stress is that when we were doing these cost, financial cost estimates, we didn't really reduce all of the other social costs of unemployment. You know, we didn't uh, reduce the cost of, for example, the impact on incarceration. You know, in the, in the state of New York, it costs $70,000 per year to lock up a person. And a person who doesn't have a job, um, you know, goes back to prison at a higher rate. Um, and we know the jobs program for former inmates, um, uh, you know, reduced recidivism a lot. So we didn't even account for, for those kinds of costs. And there are many others. I mean, uh, you know, how many kids go hungry uh, to school and they have, you know, need for uh, additional help and other programming? There's just countless. If you were to account for all of these, you could argue that, you know, it's budget neutral. But that's not what I think matters in this case for two reasons. The first is that um, the cost of unemployment are already there. They're already baked in. So you got to just simply choose. You either pay for unemployment or you pay to hire people. The second reason is that we know that unemployment yo-yos in the sense that it shoots up in recessions, comes down in, in expansions. Now, the public sector does the, all the automatic spending to stabilize the economy, provides unemployment insurance, food support, earned income tax rate, you name it. That is an automatic counter-cyclical function the public sector must perform. And it, only it can perform it. The private sector cannot. So the budget will expand and it will shrink naturally. Um, and so the number, it could be a moving target. We could chase that number. It could be zero uh, or it could be a little bigger depending on the crisis that's upon us. But it's immaterial because this is the function of the government. And from an MMT perspective, we know that when you have sovereign monetary system, you are able to more effectively employ the public spending powers to stabilize the economy. So what would be the difference if we had had a job guarantee in place and we were facing the pandemic that we're facing? How would the world look different? You know, I, I think that we would have been better prepared to deal with a pandemic. You know, think of how much we, the environmental problems didn't stop just because we stopped going to work, right? The, you know, California is still burning and somebody has to go and fight the fires. Um, you know, there's still floods, there are still hurricanes, um, the work needs to be done. And so it just so happens that it's also a bit easier to do this kind of outdoor environmental work in the middle of a pandemic. But then think of the other needs, you know, the the challenges that we had with contact tracing, the, the, the shortage of dispatchers when so many people were calling and trying to go to the hospital. Um, uh, there were some real needs in public services that... If we were thinking in terms of a public health job scores, if we were thinking in terms of preparedness to respond to climate problems, we will have on standby, if you will, you know, a, um, a public service army to address, to tackle these, these problems. But I, I want to give you the example again of, of India, because not only is the job guarantee program the largest in the world, but it has been the only lifeline that people have had during the pandemic. It's only rural employment, guaranteed rural employment, but many people who lost their urban jobs moved back to the villages and they had no jobs, but the job guarantee created them and the demand picked up. Um, uh, the hours were used up quite quickly. The guaranteed days were used up quite quickly. People were clamoring for more. Um, there were strong calls for urban guarantee. What I'm saying is, is that even in the middle of the pandemic, people can figure out how to do useful community work. And you don't have to be a terribly poor country to figure this out. We can certainly do it as well. I think on that note, that's a pretty good case for a job guarantee. I want to thank you for being with us today, uh, Pavlina Chernova. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Great talking to you. Thank you. This episode of the Road Centre podcast was produced by Dan Richards. 
For more information, go to watson.brown.edu slash roads. Thanks for listening.